Good morning. Let's try that again. Good morning. Welcome to the 17th Annual Statewide Summit for Bilingual Parents. My name is Joanne Clyde, and I am the director of the Multilingual Department for the Illinois State Board of Education. Before we get started, I have some announcements for everyone. So uh, first of all, please be sure that your cell phone is in silent mode. Uh, we have a lot of speakers and a lot of presentations throughout the day, and it would be a shame if they were interrupted. There are more than 1,100 people attending the summit today. Unfortunately, this means that the session you want to attend might be full when you get there. So we encourage you to select two or three different sessions that you're interested in so you have a backup. Please go to the interpretation table by registration if you'd like assistance from an interpreter before you go to a session. We have interpreters in 14 different languages here today. <clears throat> I would like to take a moment to introduce our interpreters. So as I say the language, I would request that they please stand up and raise their sign. We have interpreters here for Spanish. <clears throat> Arabic. Mandarin, Russian, Ukrainian, French, Karen, Dari, Portuguese, Cantonese, Polish, Pashto, and English. <laughs> Why English interpreters? Half of our sessions are offered in Spanish. So if you would like to attend one of those Spanish sessions and need an interpreter into English, we have interpreters available. For those of you who have already picked up headsets to hear your interpreters, language channels are channel one is for Spanish, channel two is for Arabic, channel three is for Mandarin, channel four is for Mongolian, channel five is for Russian, channel six is Ukrainian, and channel seven is French. Please feel free to wear a mask if you'd like during the summit. There should be a mask in your bag that you received at registration. During the day, we would also encourage you to please visit the exhibit tables. There is information at those tables on topics such as education, social services, and health care. Be sure to pick up your free book. The beautiful multicultural books are located in the South Foyer, just outside of the ballroom. Finally, before we move on to our speakers, please note 
that the men's bathroom to the right of the ballroom has been converted to a second women's bathroom. There are men's bathrooms downstairs and by the lobby of the hotel. At this time, I would like to introduce Isabel Ramirez, the Family and Community Engagement Coordinator for Cicero School District 99. Isabel Ramirez has 26 years of experience in education. During that time, she has held several positions as a teacher, parent coordinator, and administrator. Isabel has a bachelor's degree in international business from St. Xavier University. She earned a Master of Arts in Teaching from Columbia College and a Master of Arts in Educational Leadership from Lewis University. Isabel is currently the parent outreach liaison for District 99. In this position, she collaborates with all stakeholders to raise the academic achievement of students. Isabel. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. I'd like to wish happy Mother's Day to those of you mothers ahead of time. I know it's one week from now, but happy Mother's Day. I know it's hard to be here running a family and then taking time to learn, so congratulations on coming here. So before I introduce Dr. Isoye, let me tell you a little bit about him. He's going to be giving our welcome address. Dr. Stephen Isoye is the chair of the ISBE. He has more than 35 years of experience as an educator. From science teacher to department chair, curriculum leader, principal, and superintendent. Most recently, he served from 2016 to 2022 as superintendent of Niles Township High School, District 219 in Skokie, where he oversaw the development of curriculum and programmatic changes, as well as the district's work to develop and secure technology infrastructure. Dr. Isoye was previously superintendent of Oak Park and River Forest High School, District 200 in Oak Park from 2010 to 2016. He earned a doctorate in educational leadership from Northern Illinois University in DeKalb in 2011. Dr. Isoye served on the Board of Trustees for the Illinois Mathematics and Science Academy from 1998 to 2021, including as chair for four years, and on ISBE State Assessment Review Committee and Performance Evaluators Advisory Council. When the pandemic hit, he became a member of the Illinois Association of School Administrators COVID-19 SWAT team. Among his many honors, Dr. Isoye was named Illinois High School Principal of the Year in 2010 and Illinois Teacher of the Year in 1998. Please help me welcome Dr. Isoye with a warm applause. Good morning, everyone. I absolutely love the energy in this room this morning, so early in the morning as well. Absolutely, let's hear it. <laughs> and I'm honored to be here with all of you and on behalf of the entire Illinois State Board of Education, I would like to welcome you. I want to give my thanks to the ISBE Multilingual Department for ensuring that we continuously support and partner with all of you parents throughout the state to strengthen our commitment to our bilingual and EL students. The Illinois State Board of Education has promoted bilingualism with nine beliefs. And if you're new here, I'd like to at least mention what those nine beliefs are. We believe at the State Board of Education we believe the study of language and other cultures enhances the lives of our students. We believe that language learning opens the doors to cultural awareness and sensitivity. And language learning provides students with increased economic and personal opportunities. Language learning leads to a better global understanding. Language learning helps students understand their culture better. Language learning helps students develop higher order thinking skills. Language learning expands communication in the local and world communities. The world is a dynamic place and language facilitates 
adaptation, and we believe it is imperative to modify curriculum based on students' and society's needs. That's why you are all here. And that last principle is all about culturally responsive teaching. It's something that the Illinois State Board cares about very deeply. We have updated our state standards for social sciences to be more inclusive of other cultures and of marginalized perspectives. And our educator preparation programs are training teachers how to engage students from all different backgrounds by empowering student voices and family engagement. And we're providing resources to districts to support them in implementing new curricular mandates, like the inclusion of Asian American history through the TEACH Act. But as all of you are sitting there, I think it's important for you to remember that there's a lot of power in your voice. Whether you're new or you're a veteran to your, to your organization and your committee, you have a lot of strength and what you can advocate for. And it is incumbent upon all of us in the schools to work with all of you and our families. I'll give you a little bit of my background with one of the districts that I worked with and how advocacy really, really can take hold. And this is your charge. This is what you're responsible to make sure happens for your students. So this work is near and dear to my heart because of the students I had the privilege of working with while at Niles Township High School District 219 in Skokie. I was fortunate to work in a high school district. There were 4,600 students. They were in two different high school buildings. There are about 70 different languages amongst those 4,600 students that were spoken in 102 countries represented. And it was hard to determine what the top languages were because it was so diverse. But the top languages included within our district, Urdu, Spanish, Assyrian, Arabic, Tagalog, Romanian, Vietnamese, Gujarati, Bosnian, Korean, and Farsi. And more recently, students were arriving from Afghanistan, Venezuela, Ukraine, and Haiti. And it was not unusual for our students to arrive with no English experience. So what do you do? How do you support your students? How do you support your families? And just like here today, with all the interpreters that we have, the district deliberately hired paraprofessionals that could speak the languages of our highest EL populations. But we didn't stop there. We made sure that we hired teachers and support staff that were multilingual, regardless of what their subject matter discipline was. Students must see adults like them in our schools. This helped, absolutely, absolutely. This helped us communicate, but also, and just as important, learn about the different cultural backgrounds represented by all of our students and families. In addition, through advocacy from parents, the district hired family liaisons to translate letters and send out information on behalf of the district. The liaisons also provided workshops regarding technology, school in general, school events, and social services. In addition, the five elementary districts in Skokie and the high school district collaborated together with an EL parent center. Each district provided funds for this local parent center. The EL parent center provides supports to families in the community by offering courses for literacy, ESL, financial literacy, immigration issues, citizenship, and employment. And those are only a few examples that are coming from one small part of the state. Now, where does advocacy come in? This had nothing to do with the administration, but I'm going to share two stories where the community was able to gather together. So the TEACH Act, this was by our local representatives. It was co-sponsored by Representative Jennifer Gongershowitz and Senator Ron Villivallum. But where did the district come into play? They worked with our students and our teachers. Mr. Albert Chan and his students in the Asian American history class that was at Niles North, they went and they testified in front of, uh, at the state capitol for this course. Advocacy comes from everywhere. Another example of advocacy was the Syrian language. There's a large Assyrian community in the Skokie area. It was the parents, the board president, local elected officials, 
and some of the state legislators that worked with ISBE to ensure that it was included in the state course book. This course catalog allows for the course to be counted, Assyrian language to be part of the World Languages Program. Though it can be offered at schools, normally it would be an elective. In this case, it actually gets World Language credit. Why is this important? It came from the community. It came from parents just like you. They're the ones who advocated for their students and their families. And I know many of you here today are members of the Bilingual Parent Advisory Committee from your town and your, and your community, and I want to express my sincere appreciation for the time and energy you have devoted and the amazing ideas that you have generated for your districts and will generate. As a former teacher and administrator, I can tell you that we rely on parents like you to partner with us in order to make sure that all of our students could be successful. Nurturing the gift of bilingualism truly takes teamwork between the adults at home and the adults in school. We have yet to truly understand the gift of the thinking and how the brain is wired when you're working with different languages. We have to bring that to the table. We have to appreciate how thinking is very different for students that are multilingual. That truly is a gift that they hold. So thank you for all of you and everything that you do. I hope you have an inspiring and energizing day that you can get into the, the meetings that you're hoping to at this conference and that you leave with the information and connections you need to be advocates for your students and for multilingual learning in your community. Thank you. Let's thank Dr. Isaiah again. Thank you very much. Now I have the honor and the pleasure of introducing you to State Representative Abdel Nasir Rashid. He will give another welcome address. Let me tell you a little bit about him. Illinois State Representative Abdel Nasir Rashid represents the 21st House District, which includes the Southwest suburb communities of Berwyn. Are we here? Bridgeview? Burbank, LaGrange, LaGrange Park, and Summit. Representative Rashid is the son of Palestinian immigrants who moved to Chicago 53 years ago. His career has been focused on fighting for working families and building a strong middle class. He has a Bachelor of Arts degree from Harvard University and a Master of Business Administration in Finance and Economics from the University of Chicago Booth School of Business. His legislative priorities include property tax relief, affordable housing, environmental protection, and consumer protection. Prior to his election in November of 2022, Representative Rashid worked for the Illinois Coalition for Immigration and Refugee Rights, served as Deputy Chief of Staff to former Cook County Clerk David Orr, and was Chief Policy Officer for Cook County Assessor Kaji. He is also a former field director for Jesus Chuy Garcia for mayor in 2015 and former Illinois deputy state director for Bernie Sanders for president in 2016. Representative Rajid is the first Palestinian American to serve in the Illinois House of Representatives. He lives in Bridgeview with his wife and his three children. Please let's welcome Representative Rashid. I'm sorry about that. Good morning, everyone. Let me get this over here. There we go. Good morning. Um, let, let me start off by uh, thanking the Illinois Research uh, Center Director Josie Yanguas uh, and your team for the invitation. Yes, let's give her a round of applause and the whole team for all the work that you've done. I'd also like to recognize Superintendent Tony Sanders, the chair of the Illinois State Board of Education, uh, Stephen Isoye, and the director of the multilingual department, Joanne Clyde. Um, thank you for your tremendous work and dedication to education and advocating on behalf of students across the state. Uh, muchísimas gracias por la invitación y por poder ser parte de la Decimo Septima Cumbre Anual para Padres Bilingües 
este año. I'm honored. <laughs> yeah. Let me say, I, I was so proud to, I, I was so privileged and lucky to grow up in not just a bilingual household, but a trilingual household. Uh, my parents moved from Palestine to Puerto Rico um, and lived there for several years, learned Spanish before moving to Chicago. And so growing up, of course, we spoke English and my parents spoke Arabic with us, but I heard them always speaking Spanish, especially, especially when they didn't want us to understand what they were saying. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but we caught on eventually, and so I do understand quite a bit of Spanish. Um, and it was very important in our household that we learn Arabic so that we be, continue to be connected to our own heritage um, and our culture. And in a world that's becoming increasingly diverse, being able to speak more than one language is an essential skill. A dual language and bilingual programs provide students with the opportunity to learn another language while also receiving instructions in their native language. As we all know, uh, this approach not only helps students become fluent in a second language, but also helps them maintain their native language, creating a strong sense of cultural identity and pride. Studies have shown that students who participate in dual language and bilingual programs tend to perform better academically. These programs have been found to improve cognitive flexibility, critical thinking, problem solving, and creativity, which are all essential skills for success in the 21st century. In addition to the academic benefits, dual language and bilingual programs can also have a positive impact on our economy. As businesses become more global, the demand for bilingual employees is increasing. Investing in dual language and bilingual programs can help produce a workforce that's better equipped to meet the demands of a diverse economy, which can ultimately lead to increased economic growth and prosperity. However, many schools across our state and country don't offer these programs. That's why it's important for the state uh, to invest in programs that ensure all students have access to these valuable educational opportunities regardless of their socioeconomic background. Um, I'm very proud to share that my bill, HB 3822, has passed out of both chambers and is on its way to the governor's desk. What this bill does is it requires the state to develop a comprehensive report to support the development and expansion of dual language programs across the state. It is, it is actually my first bill in, as a state representative to pass both chambers. I'm very proud of that. <laughs> Once we receive the report that this bill generates, I'm committed to working with my colleagues and with all of you to take meaningful action to expand access to dual language programs in our state. I look forward to our work together, both in Springfield, in the 21st District, and throughout the state, as we continue to advocate for the future of all students and their access to crucial educational opportunities they need to succeed. Thank you all very much. Okay. Buenos dias. Good morning. I am Carolina Fabian. I am the new director of family and community engagement for the Illinois State Board of Education. And previous to this role, I have held other positions such as paraprofessional, teacher, administrator, and I am also an elected board member of the Waukegan Public School District. You can find my crowd real easily. <laughs> However, no title has given me more satisfaction than that of parent. It is a difficult job with a lot of overtime and no pay. Therefore, I want to personally thank you all for taking your time out of your busy weekends to learn how you can help your children grow academically and multiculturally. Thank you, parents. I am here today because I have the great honor of introducing your new state superintendent, who was recently appointed and began his term in February 2023. After I read his biography, you will understand why he was chosen to lead the charge of the children of Illinois. Many of you may know him from his work in School District U46, 
the second largest school district in Illinois, where he served as superintendent for nearly a decade. During his tenure at U46, he made significant changes on behalf of all students there. I will list just a few. He added full day kindergarten, created a new alternative high school to reduce expulsions and better serve students in need of trauma-informed care, invested in a grow your own educator initiative and improved the district's financial standing while overseeing a $660 million budget. Apart from being here today, he has shown his commitment to bilingual students by growing U46's dual language program. He has been a fierce advocate for the implementation of evidence-based funding to change Illinois public schools funding structure and provide greater equity for students across Illinois. What I have found fascinating are his roles prior to becoming a superintendent of U46. We all know communication is key and you will be happy to know that we have someone in leadership who has consistently demonstrated this skill. In 2014, he served as the district's chief of communications and accountability and then chief of staff. He previously served as chief of communications officer for the St. Louis Public Schools and in communications and governmental relations roles within the Illinois government, including at ISBE. Additionally, he has held positions on numerous boards and committees, including the large county-wide Suburban District Consortium, Suburban Superintendents Association, Large Unit District Association Board of Directors, Illinois Association of School Administrators COVID-19 Transition Team, the Latino College Landscape Study Advisory Committee, and the Vision 2020 Committee for Equitable School Funding. This is not only because he has a wealth of experience, but also a wealth of knowledge. He earned his bachelor's degree from the University of Illinois Springfield, his master's in business administration from New York Institute of Technology, his chief school of business um, office endorsement from Northern Illinois University. He has an honorary doctorate from, of laws from Judson University and his doctorate of education from Aurora University. Due to all his work and experience, he has received multiple honors, including the 2021 Illinois Association of School Administrators Superintendent of Distinction, 2021 Award of Merit from the Illinois Public School Relations Associations for his weekly newsletter, 2019 Elgin Area Chamber of Comfort Commerce Leadership Award, and 2015 Hanover Park Educator of the Year. I am almost quite certain he was born for this role, as he is following in his father's footsteps and becoming the state superintendent, although being an educator was not his first initial inclination. Proving that parents can have a great impact and influence on their children, even if you don't see it at first. Who is this marvelous man, you may ask? It's none other than Dr. Tony Sanders, and I invite Dr. Sanders to wow them all from here. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hopefully this, yeah, great. My lavalier is working. I don't know that I can live up to that expectation, but I thank you so much for the wonderful, uh, for the wonderful words. I'm going to start by telling you the story of a little boy. This is a house in Santa Fe, New Mexico. The little boy that lived in this house was the youngest son of four the son of two teachers, a father who was a middle school math teacher and a mother who was an elementary music teacher. And that little boy did not know how to read, had no clue how to read. He'd go to school every day, he would get sick to his stomach every day that it time, came time to go to school. He memorized <clears throat> every word to this book, the monster at the end of this book with fuzzy, lovable, furry Grover. And he memorized it so that when it was time for reading with his mom and his dad or his brothers or his sister that he would pretend to know how to read because he knew the words, he just didn't know how to read them. He just memorized every single word. And that little boy growing up in Santa Fe, New Mexico, learned enough Spanish to say, entiendo un poco pero no hablo muy bien. <laughs> that little boy was me. This is me in second grade, the young kid that really struggled going to Chaparral Elementary School every day. 
I had two incidents that happened in addition to not being able to read. I had a teacher that was just not the very nicest teacher and I was stung by bees and some, for some reason I associated those two things together. And so every morning I would throw a fit when it was time to go to school. A few years later, my father became a state superintendent for the first time. He, uh, in the state of Nevada, he was selected to be the next state superintendent. And when we moved to Nevada, I was tested on my first day of school, and they found out that I couldn't read, and they immediately put me into a self-contained special education classroom. And they called my father and they told him, your son's been placed into this classroom, there you go. This was pre-IDEA, by the way, but for those of you in education, it was before they had laws that said you had a process that you had to go through in order to place a child. So on my dad's second day on the job as state superintendent, he left his office, he came down to the school, he met with the principal at Fremont Elementary School, and he said, not for my child. No, not for my child. And so the principal heeded that word. Of course, he's talking to the state superintendent. And so they put me back into a general education classroom. They gave me all the interventions and supports that I needed. And I stand before you today as the state superintendent of education, who of course can read and write. I say all that because, well, for two reasons. Number one, it was the first recognition I had as a child of the privilege that comes when you have actively engaged parents. Your work as parents in your school districts helps give your children the privilege that they need to succeed. So I want you to give yourselves a round of applause. It also taught me at a very early age the importance of advocating on behalf of all children, right? That is our job, is to advocate for every single child that comes through our doors. And that means meeting their specialized needs and meeting their language needs and cultural needs as well. In U46, oh, yeah, by the way, you can tell the shirt, uh, I had to burn that shirt later on. That, that's just, it's a really horrible shirt. So that led me, uh, growing up, we grew up, I grew up in Nevada, moved to Illinois in high school. Uh, as you heard, I chose to not follow in the footsteps of my parents. I did not go into education. I became a disc jockey. So I was a local radio disc jockey, moved my way into communications work in the state level, and eventually this long and winding path led me to school district U46. Anybody from U46 here? Oh, that's a shame. I'm gonna have to call them out, they're not here. So U46, as you heard, is the state's second largest school district. We covered 90 square miles, serving 11 different communities in the northwest suburbs, 38,000 students and 4,000 full-time staff. And we truly believe that diversity was our strength. Do you agree that diversity is our strength? Oh. I'm going to let you watch this video, and then we're going to have a conversation about it. Please watch this. This is a song sung by a brown thrasher, but that's just one of the thousand or more that it knows. And it's not the only avian virtuoso. A wood thrush can sing two pitches at once. A mockingbird can match the sounds around it, including car alarms. And the Australian superb lyrebird has an incredible elaborate song and dance ritual. These are just a few of the 4,000 species of songbirds. Most birds produce short, simple calls. But songbirds also have a repertoire of complex vocal patterns that help them attract mates, defend territory, and strengthen their social bonds. Each songbird species has its own distinct song patterns, some with characteristic regional dialects. Experienced listeners can even distinguish individual birds by their unique songs. So how do birds learn these songs in the first place? How do they know to mimic the songs of their own species? Are they born knowing how to sing? A lot of what scientists know about bird song comes from studying zebra finches. A baby male zebra finch typically learns to sing from its father or other males. 
starting while it's still a fledgling in the nest. First comes a sensory learning phase, when the baby finch hears the songs sung around it and commits them to memory. The bird starts to vocalize during the motor learning phase, practicing until it can match the song it memorized. As the bird learns, hearing the tutor's song over and over again is helpful, up to a point. If he hears it too many times, the imitation degrades. And the source matters. If the song is played through a loudspeaker, he can't pick it up as easily. But hide the same loudspeaker inside a toy painted to look like a zebra finch, and his learning improves. What if the baby never hears another zebra finch's song? Interestingly enough, it'll sing anyway. Isolated finches still produce what are called innate or isolate songs. A specific tune might be taught, but the instinct to sing seems to be hardwired into a songbird's brain. Innate songs sound different from the cultured songs learned from other finches at first. If isolate zebra finches start a new colony, the young birds pick up the isolate song from their parents, but the song changes from generation to generation, and after a few iterations, the melody actually starts to resemble the cultured songs sung by zebra finches in the wild. Something about the learning process must be hardwired too, drawing the birds towards the same song patterns again and again. This means that basic information about the zebra finch song must be stored somewhere in its genome, imprinted there by millions of years of evolution. At first, this might seem odd, as we usually think of genetic code as a source of biochemical or physical traits not something like a behavior or action. But the two aren't fundamentally different. We can connect genomes to behavior through brain circuitry. The connection is noisy and quite complex. It doesn't simply map single genes to single behaviors, but it exists. Genomes contain codes for proteins that guide brain development, such as molecules that guide the pathways of developing axons, shaping distinct circuits. Birds' brains have so-called song circuits that are active when the birds sing. These circuits also respond to the song of a bird's own species more strongly than to other species' songs. So the theory is that a bird's genes guide development of brain circuits that relate to singing and the ability to learn songs. Then exposure to songs shapes those neural circuits to produce the songs that are typical to that species. Genetically encoded or innate behaviors aren't unique to songbirds. They're widespread in the animal kingdom. Spectacular examples include the long-distance migrations of monarch butterflies and salmon. So what does this mean for humans? Are we also born with innate information written into our genomes that helps shape our neural circuits and ultimately results in something we know? Could there be some knowledge that is unique and intrinsic to humans as a species. By watching this video, you are actually part of an information sharing network that connects millions of lifelong learners across the globe. But did you know that we're also developing a network for student ideas? TED-Ed's Student Voice Initiative is supporting young people across the globe so you, uh, in sharing their ideas. Isn't it interesting how a bird learns how to sing? And how even if it's not exposed to the, its native language, it still will pick up and, and replicate that as it grows older. So I'm going to take one minute. I know I don't want to over video you, but now I'm going to show you a video about how humans learn. And then I'm going to have you spend a few minutes turning and talking to each other about what the implications of these videos are. the social brain has been totally underestimated. It's a driving force in learning. It's the gateway to cognition. We have evidence that the social brain is operating to assist learning throughout the lifespan. So let's think about human babies. We know in the development of language that there's a very important period between six months and 12 months of age where babies are mastering the sounds of language. So we've done experiments in which babies are exposed to a foreign language right at that critical moment. They're listening to a Mandarin speaker when they're growing up in an English family. 
What we've demonstrated is that if a baby at nine months has 12 sessions of play with a live human speaker, they learn so well that they're statistically equivalent to the babies in the foreign country who've been listening for 10 months. However, if the babies are exposed to the same material at the same time, same room, same dosage, but not exposed to a live human being and instead on a beautiful DVD, they stare at it, you think they're learning, but the brain tests following exposure show that the kids in the machine group learned nothing, but the babies in the live group learned so well they matched the babies in the foreign country. So there's something about being in the presence of another human being and watching the eyes and watching the movements and paying attention to what that person is doing. That social context is extremely important to learning. We can see it in school-age children who use the social brain when they're interacting with one another to collaborate, when they're studying how another person goes at it, when they're watching the eyes, even unconsciously, of their study partner to work towards a solution together. In fact, I like to say the social brain gates human learning, that without the motivation and information provided by the social brain, learning just doesn't take off in the same way that it does when the social brain is engaged. So we're going to take a few minutes now at your tables. Please just have a quick conversation about what connections do you make between these two videos and language acquisition? What's something new that you learned? And do you see any implications for our work in serving students? So just give a few minutes at your table, have a conversation, please. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring you back. All right, let's go ahead and come back. Let's go ahead and come back if we can. Anybody wanna share out anything that you saw? Anything that you wanna, any discussion points? Yes. The idea of learning well 
you need both to be educated, learning from your school and from your home and your community, right? Learning from home and your community. That's exactly right. Any other feedback? Anybody else have discussions you want to share out? Everybody's rushing to raise their hand. I see it. Yes. Yes. So a great point being made up here. Did you notice that in both videos, both birds and humans learned due to social interaction. They learned from being around each other. They didn't learn, they did not learn when it came to them via a device or a speaker. Right? So let's think, that, think about that for just a minute. For our youngest learners, if I could get, it, get you back to, if I could get you back. Our youngest learners do not learn when it's given to them electronically on a screen. Their recall of that just does not work. So when somebody holds your phone up, can somebody hold your phone up? So when you hand your phone off to a small child, it is not helping them to learn. It doesn't help them learn. What helps a child to learn is that social interaction, looking you in the eyes, touching, feeling, playing together. That's how children learn. So that's one of my key takeaways from this. The other is that learning languages early is important, not just English. Learning native languages of your culture is important to learn early and to maintain throughout your life. Do you agree? So the other things I noticed in these videos is the importance of parents, right? In each case, you saw the importance, the parent, important role that parents played in the, the education of their child. That's why we are here today, and that's why you're involved as bilingual parent advisory committees. And I wanna thank you for your willingness to serve. We know that school districts are required to have a BPAC when there are 20 English learners of the same home language. They are composed of bilingual parents, legal guardians with students currently enrolled in EL programs, teachers and other school staff, and EL community leaders. BPACs are mutually, benef mutually beneficial. They empower parents, they enlighten educators on students' needs, and they provide educators with the information they need to create the best programs and policies. We have several hundred districts that need to assemble BPACs and have not done so yet. If your district has a BPAC for more than 10 years, please stand up. If you've had a BPAC for more than 10 years, please stand up. Let's give them a round of applause. If you're in your first year of having a bilingual parent advisory committee, please stand up, your first year. Let's give them a round of applause. And if your district does not have one, that's why we want you to stay here today, learn, talk to your peers, go back, and let's get it, let's get it going. In Illinois, 77% of school districts have English learners, and our students speak more than 270 different languages. We've seen an increase in English learners this year, in part uh, due to several reasons. Some are coming, uh, families coming in from Ukraine, uh, due to conflicts uh, in that area and other parts of the world. Another large group are asylum seekers who were bused into Chicago from the Texas border. A majority of these families have found their apartments and are integrating into communi communities in Chicago and Cook counties. In fact, one of the first things I did when I was named state superintendent was I sent a note to every superintendent in the suburbs before I even took the official position asking them to take in families 
if they could do so at all. And many of our communities stood up and said, we'll take any families you want to send our way. So if you're one of those communities, give yourselves a round of applause. In U46, we had this philosophy that no student should have to lose a language to gain a language, right? No student needs to lose a language to gain a language. Your advocacy and your presenting power in your local districts will help ensure that that can be the mantra across the state of Illinois. We are lucky, more than 60 Illinois school districts offer dual language programs. Yeah, isn't that awesome? In my time in U46, you heard that um, Dr. Tose Torres, my predecessor, started a dual language program, and I was honored to continue that until it rolled all the way up to high school. So pre-K to high school, 12,000 students in U46 are going to graduate bilingual and biliterate. Isn't that amazing? We need to continue this trend, though. We know, if you look at the scores across national, international tests, the PISA test, you see the, the same countries at the top time and time again. Singapore, Finland, right? You, you name it. And if you Google any one of those countries, the one overriding theme that you will find is every one of them requires a student to learn more than their home language. Every one of them. Shouldn't we do that here? Yes? All right, let's work together on it. I want to quote Isabella Larzo, an eighth grader at Harvard Junior High in Harvard, Illinois. Earlier this year, she won the National Association for Bilingual Education's essay contest. Isn't that great? We have some folks from Harvard here. You probably want to stand up and be recognized. There you go. So Isabella was born in the United States, but she's learned Spanish from her grandmother who lives with the family. The title of her essay is The Blessing of Being Bilingual. In it, she writes that being bilingual, quote, can open doors in work, school, or just to talk and enjoy being with your family. It allows us to learn from other cultures and to work together to solve problems. It's a profound statement that we can all learn from. She also writes about teaching her grandmother English and that her grandmother is becoming fluent at the age of 76. That speaks to the heart of what biliteracy is all about. One of our best opportunities in Illinois is when we celebrate our families and students through the seal of biliteracy. Illinois is one of the first states in the nation, fourth, I believe, actually, to start offering the seal of biliteracy. If you're not familiar with it, I want you to encourage you to support your students to maximize the value of their bilingualism through the seal of biliteracy. This is a stamp that gets placed on a student's high school diploma in all their official records, and it signifies to colleges, universities, and potential employers that a child is fully bilingual and biliterate. Some teachers actually take it just a little bit too, too far. They actually uh, created a seal, uh, or, or, or seal, uh, instead of the actual seal. So uh, if you ever want to have fun with the seal of biliteracy, that's a great way to do so. I'm going to speed up a little bit and just highlight uh, some of the things I know I'm running short on time. So we're proud to say that in 2018, we had 80 school districts participating and 5,750 5, seals in 23 different languages. And by 2022, 116 districts participated, a 45% increase, and we awarded 6,816 seals in 38 different languages. AP is another area where we've shown incredible growth uh, in, in terms of serving our students. Uh, we've seen a dramatic growth because of the AP Spanish language exam. I know in U46, students would take that exam their freshman year, pass it, and they would walk away with AP college credit walking out their door.
I want to quickly get to at least our partnership with the University of Illinois. Uh, I'm also excited to talk to you about our, uh, this partnership with the University of Illinois. Too often immigrant children or immigrant parents have to rely on their own children to act as interpreters during crucial meetings. That's a tough role for a child. It's especially unfair if the child is being asked to interpret for their own IEP meeting. So we've entered into a new partnership with UIC and we'll train interpreters in social terminology and procedures of IEP meetings so that, that they, their students do no longer have to be their interpreters in IEP meetings. The other work that has continued to support bilingual learners, of course, is our chain transformation to the evidence-based funding formula, which uplifts bilingualism and supports all school districts, as well as the important work around early childhood and trying to provide every child in this state an opportunity to be in early childhood. In closing, tied to that early childhood funding is a wonderful opportunity for you to get involved in this year's state budget. We want to continue to encourage the legislature, and you've got a legislator here who supports the evidence-based funding formula, who supports early childhood education and wants to make sure that we continue to see that expand, and supports the teacher pipeline work that we have to do. We must address the needs of, in, of recruiting and retaining bilingual and special education teachers specifically in the state of Illinois. It is an honor for me to be here with you today. Thank you for being my first keynote as the state superintendent. I will look forward to coming back time and time again. And if you want to follow me on Twitter or uh, Instagram or anything, I'm on all over social media. So Joanne, thank you all so much. I appreciate you being here. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Sanders. It was a pleasure to listen to you and to, to hear you, your, uh, your comments about bilingual education and the importance of it. Before we dismiss to go to our next sessions, I have a few announcements. First of all, we have found a lost phone. If you are missing your phone, please go to the registration table at the front in order to retrieve it. Please also take all your belongings with you when you leave this room because we will need to reset it for lunch um, and there's no guarantee that it will be here when you return. Um, again, another reminder that the, the men's bathroom on this floor in the corner has been turned into a women's bathroom. So gentlemen, there's a restroom downstairs or in the lobby of the hotel. Thank you all for coming to the 17th Annual Bilingual Parents Summit. Enjoy the rest of your day and return here for lunch at 1245. Thank you.